Okay, yeah, so I um, basically I became, a, a, um, when, at the start of my career, I was, I was a usability researcher and lecturer at UCL. And then in the mid-90s, I sort of fell into, um, in, into security as one of those areas where I think um, it's probably the last area where people think usability doesn't really matter. I think a lot of a lot of people have the who are security specialists have the attitude, uh, particular practitioners have the attitude that security is important, so everyone should do what we say, right? Um, but we've really found out to our cost that that isn't the case, and that actually economically it doesn't make sense. Um, so we. Um, you know, not everybody can become a security expert that would completely ruin our whole economic system. You know, it doesn't make any more sense than saying everybody has to be a fireman and, uh, <laughs> you know, a first, you know, a first aid, you know, a qualified first aider up to a really high level and so on. Um, so we need to take this challenge a bit more seriously. And um, one of the reasons I moved to Bourbon was to work on this project called CASA, which is cybersecurity in the age of large scale adversaries. Uh, where, um, and, and one of the main selling points of this, it's, it's an excellence cluster project, which in Germany is a pretty big deal. So uh, we, have, like, we got like over 30 million euros for a, for a five year project to work on this. Um, and one of the, the special things about it was that my, my colleagues basically in, in Hub A, B and C basically work on maths and on the technical aspects of implementing uh, cryptography. Uh, and in Hub D, um, we're looking at, at really how people use, use it and, and, and on, it's basically called on usability and adoption. You know, can people use it? But the other really fundamental question is, do they actually want to use it? <laughs> So uh, this is, uh, you know, um, it's a really big, big thing. If you basically sort of look like, I mean, one of the examples we used in the application and when we explained it to the selection panel is that with PGP, for instance, we've had a pretty good, you know, email encryption algorithm for over 20 years, yet um, less than 1% of the world's email is actually end-to-end -end encrypted at the moment, right? So you can actually argue that it's not really made its way out into practice. And our, um, the, the, the challenge um, as for, for our part of the project is to figure out why that is and to not repeat these mistakes again with the new cryptography um, that, that our colleagues are using. So we've essentially got two strands, one which is we, we call learning from the past. We're looking at basically why the existing algorithms and, um, aren't really making their way into implementations, why existing implementations aren't actually being adopted by the various, um, I mean, mostly we're looking at companies, you know, particularly small and medium-sized companies that should be using them. Um, and the other part is actually really, is, is then to, to look to the future and, and basically identify, essentially we identify blockers, but also if it's worked somewhere, what was the enabler? for the encrypted solution, making it into practice. We're trying to then uh, project that onto the new technology, uh, to the new algorithms and the new technologies being met and, and seeing that, you know, don't make the same mistake. So we don't make the same mistake again, but we're learning from the successful examples that what we're doing. And so basically, um, I want to cover some aspects of this, this in the talk. It's really one of the learning from the past. So I want to basically talk about one of the, the some of the key reasons that are currently holding up um, the the adoption. So so that what we're doing here is very sort of practice focused. Uh, but I also really want to look at the research that's happened in this area and actually point out that I think maybe the res research has had the wrong the the usability of cryptography research has had the wrong taken the wrong approach to the problem. And that we maybe need to need sort of like a fundamental reboot. Um, for me, actually moving to Bochum and actually saying like I'm now going to focus on usability of cryptography is quite an interesting one because arguably usable security started in 1999. The two most cited papers in usable security were published that year. Um, one of them, one of the two was uh, Users Are Not the Enemy, which I'm a co-author of. Uh, and that was about why passwords with the associated current policies 
actually can't really be used um, in, you know, where people really can't cope. And it's not that they don't want to, it's just the human brain isn't built <laughs> that way. You know, and by insisting that people should do things that are humanly impossible, you know, that's actually what we showed in this, in the case study reported in that paper, you're really completely turning them off security. You're making them see as something that's impossible and it's just uh, invented by evil security experts in order to make their lives difficult. You know? Arguably, it's taken a long, long time, but we have finally seen some movement, right? We've seen um, certainly in the in the UK, uh, the National Cyber Security Centre in 2015 revised its deadlines. NIST followed through, through two years later, and basically the essential change, if you look at the new guidelines, is that the strength of the password is not the dominant factor anymore. Is that um, you know basically it's very clearly says is uh, the service provider should bear. Um, a bigger share of the burden and it shouldn't be put onto the end user. It encourages the use of two-factor authentication, um, password managers and all kinds of like tools that make the job more, more manageable, you know, and it got rid of things like, like mandatory expiry of passwords for no good reason, etc., etc. So arguably, I now feel kind of like in authentication, things are moving in the right direction, finally. But that leaves us with the, um, the other paper, which is Why Johnny Can't Encrypt by Alma Witten and Doug Tiger. Um, so, uh, and I felt it's like, okay, so if we've now cracked, <laughs> cracked the password thing, finally, it's time to, to meet this other big challenge, you know, and look at what's really happened in that space and, and why haven't we seen a parallel sort of improvement um, in the usability of cryptography. So uh, Alma Witten basically looked at, um, already mentioned PGP, so this is the first um, uh, implementation of PGP with a graphical user interface. And kind of when Phil Zimmerman set up, he said it himself, you know, when you set up the company to, to basically start to popularize PGP, he assumed that putting a GUI onto it would be, that would make it usable. <laughs> and uh, what Alma showed in the study that even with some quite careful instruction and hugely motivating scenarios, so she created a scenario for her participants where they were working on a presidential campaign and they were like, you know, communicating with each other about where they were going to be next and what was going to be said. And obviously it would be really, really bad if the other candidates, uh, people found out about this. And kind of, so it's actually, it's a lovely scenario, which if you're interested in this, go and Google for Johnny too, because that it, the original paper suffers from some of the problems that we've seen in usable security is that the experimental setup isn't very well documented and actually Simpson Garfinkel went and literally like bugged, you know, followed Alma Witten around for several days until she'd finally revealed all the details of how she'd run the experiment and he documented it in this Johnny 2 paper. So if you ever want to repeat in a study, please go and look at the Johnny 2 um, description. But Almas, I mean, the big thing is this was a Usenix paper. It caused a huge stir um, in at Usenix 99 uh, when she basically found that only two out of her two participants could actually uh, send, you know, manage, despite good instruction and huge maturation, manage to uh, encrypt and send, you know, send an encrypted message and manage to decrypt uh, a message that was sent to them successfully. And that um, the even more worrying thing was that out of the 10 people who didn't manage to do it, quite a few of them thought they had sent the message in encrypted format, and in fact, that sent it in uh, in plain text. Yeah. So um, that was, uh, so, so that was that thing. And so um, it's a really, I mean, it's really, it's fantastic. It was a fantastic idea to do this study and to this achievement. Then for me, as a usability person, looking at that paper, things start to slightly go wrong because I can't follow some of the arguments she made from, from in her. The first one I don't have an argument with. It's very, very clear that the way PGP was set up did not follow the way of how people think about composing and then encrypting and sending a message. You know, it basically had the process back to front where you had to create the keys and everything beforehand before you'd even written the message, right? Whereas people sort of like think about it as I write it and then I secure it. Um, the, the whole thing to, um, you know, sort of like the, the labels and what's on it, and we're gonna come back to that later. It's a really, really key thing is the terms lead pe people make, make actually the wrong conclusions about what the terms they see mean. 
such as signing, you know, the message and so on. I'll come back to that later. Um, and the other part of it was, you know, the really elementary failing in, 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 in user interface design is there was no feedback. There was, wasn't clear feedback about that. So it wouldn't say, I've now sent the message to this recipient in encrypted format. So that means, you know, if you make a mistake, you can't actually learn from it if you, if you don't get that. So that latter part argument is arguably the easiest to, to fix. I think she, what she did really get, get right was that she, she figured, she's basically said, it's these key building blocks in the language that are causing a problem. You know, she said, normal uh, locks uh, use the same key to lock and unlock. And the key metaphor will lead people to expect the same for encryption and decryption uh, if it's not visually clarified in that way. So I think that first sentence is absolutely correct. And then it goes wrong. <laughs> as far as, as a usability person, I'm saying like, no, you've got the wrong end of the stick. She says that faulty intuition in this case may lead them to assume that they can always decrypt anything they have encrypted in an assumption which may have um, upsetting consequences. This is true. But this is now immediately, you can see here that the blame is being put on the individual, right? It's, um, it's basically, they get it wrong. You know, they, they inter but the fact that they're eff effectively applying the everyday understanding to these terms equals faulty intuition, i.e. the human is at fault here. Um, and that actually, um, you know, sort of like she, she then basically um, looked at the signing and signature. And, and I think this is actually, this is really the fascinating thing is a lot of what she says is absolutely correct. She diagnoses correctly what people are getting wrong, but then the attribution and therefore then also what you do about it is in my view wrong. You know, she's basically saying like, uh, well, really, um, you know, sort of like, I'll come, I'll come back to, to uh, you know, really, um, sorry, it's uh, just gonna go skip over. So I've got them somehow, somehow in the wrong order here. So she, she basically said that, um, you know, so this is wrong. But then what she, uh, what did she do next? Sorry, I somehow I've got these slides in the wrong order and we really need to go to the key. Key bit uh, for um, for later. Sorry. Uh, so, nah. Yeah. So she basically went to this um, this like well, let's fix right. Basically, what we need to do is fix the users. So her argument is um, is is here. Um, I develop a tutorial to explain to everybody how public key encryption works. Right? And her argument is there are significant benefits to supporting users in developing a certain base level and generalizable security knowledge. A user who knows that regardless of what application is in use, one kind of tool protects the privacy of transmission, a second protects the integrity, and a third protects the access to local resources, is much more empowered um, than one who must start afresh with each application. Now, to you as a security expert, you basically look at it, and it might make sense, you know, but what does it, this look like to an ordinary user? Um, it would be, you lost me at two. <laughs> uh, because if you, you know, basically you, you want to send messages, you want to communicate, and it's, it's basically once the overhead that's involved in doing that securely goes over a certain level, and we call this uh, the compliance budget, you know, we, we at some point labeled this in, in some of our studies the compliance budget, then people just decide it's not worth it and they ditch the security, right? So um, if you, I think it's actually, I think her conclusion is wrong. You know, you, you will not get people to actually sit through a, a one and a half day tutorial to learn how public key encryption works. You know, and then if you go out, if you're not using it all the time, you would very quickly forget everything you've learned anyway, and you start again from scratch everywhere. And in a way, I mean, it's actually in her, if you read her PhD thesis, which is available, be quiet, uh, which is available online, you know, she, she actually found in there, she said, you know, when presented with a software program incorporating visible key cryptography, users often complain during the first 10 to 15 minutes of the testing, they would expect that sort of thing to be handled invisibly. 
<laughs> but as the exposure to the software continued and the understanding of this, they generally ceased to make that complaint. And I'm going like, no, 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 Alma. <laughs> they just realized that complaining to you didn't make a difference. So they went like, Sh I'll shut up and finish <laughs> the rest of the session I was paid to do, <laughs> right? Um, so, so, and that is, is, it's, it's really, you know, I think if you want people to really use, adopt and use the technology, you need to be, you know, it's not, you cannot impose, you know, your wishful thinking and you can't ask for them to know as much as you do about it, right? It has to be, you have to really be able to put the whole thing in a format that is manageable and only takes a certain amount of time and effort, you know? And that is, I think, to some extent, what's continued to bedevil this area is that, that the complexity hasn't gone away. The amount of stuff that people really have to know to do it correctly hasn't gone away. Um, and that's really held it back. Um, so this is basically when people say, you know, I don't want to do this. This is too much. As a designer, you have to listen to it in every er other area of technology design. People would go like, whoa, right, we have a problem here. Let's look at how we can make this more usable. But because many, you know, particularly you know, practitioners, basically have this attitude like, no, 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 you know, you just have to do this properly and you just have to know everything. Um, that's really what's, what's held it back. You know, so it's an old New Yorker cartoon, um, which I think explains this, this it sort of like visualizes this really well, you know, that the security of the expert here on the left hand side who has a complete structural model in their head of how the whole thing works. And that's why for him, when you use terms like key and public and private and so on, it's jargon. It's a shorthand for communicating to somebody else who has the same model what you're talking about. But if you're trying to communicate that to somebody who doesn't have a complete structural model, you've got the problem that they will, you know, they will always, I mean, you can try and, and, and beat it into them, but they will always, if you don't do this all the time, they're not gonna acquire the complete structural model, which means that for them, they will always end up having um, the everyday meaning of terms like key, you know, public, private, signing, and whatever, the everyday meaning will always come back and attach it to it, right? So that's, that's really, and I think it's, 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 it's a bit of a shame that that has never really been, been sort of made clear in the research community, that there actually is a fundamental gap between what actually the people who are trying to do usability of encryption believe and what uh, a non-security usability researcher would say to them, like, you know, forget it. This is not going to happen. You know, you're not going to get people to do this. So, um, what we what we would really want, what a usability um, specialist would tell you is, look, you know, we have all sorts of complex devices. People don't have a structural model of them, but they can operate them perfectly correctly. You know, I mean, the car we're, we're all driving is, um, you know, is an example of this. I'm not saying that there isn't some f amount of training required. There isn't some amount of knowledge you need to acquire to use it, to use it correctly. But it's not the full structural model on the left, right? What users have when they operate these things correctly is, is a task action model. Right. They have a limited set of tasks they want to fulfill with that device and they know what they have to, they approach the, they approach the, the, the device, the program, and they know what they have to do in order to do it. And that will be all the more easier if the whole thing is, is built based on, the, um, um, uh, based on the knowledge of what tasks people actually want to do. And if those tasks are really clearly represented at the top, that's what it, that's what it takes. Um, and then I would argue what we need is we probably need a new, new clean language in order to express the different function that cryptography does. Um, that's conceptually, um, it's quite easy, but <laughs> as you will see in, 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 my next, in, in some of my examples, it's not that easy, you know, it's not even, you know, I can't do that like this. Uh, I'm still working on it. But I think that we need to, to really take the shift. And I, I love basically Phil, Philip Allen Baker said it at, at a FIKI workshop uh, over 10 years ago. 
you know, people want to protect themselves, but they don't want to join a crypto cult. And we have to really get to the point where they can, you know, where they can actually use the technology and where it's perfectly okay for us as specialists to use the jungle amongst us, but that's not how we would talk to people about about these tools and that's not the labels you would expect to um, expect to see so um, there's there's uh, some really ongoing very promising research I mean what's actually been discovered um, I just want to highlight here one um, one researcher who I think has done some absolutely cracking work on this Katharina Krampals from CISPA in, in Saarbrücken um, because, uh, and it's, it's been, and I've been very heartened to see it's been published in really the absolutely top uh, computer security conferences, um, that she's actually started to, to point out that the same, you know, essentially that people who you think of as technical have the same problem as the end users, right? So you can't assume that your software developer or your systems administrator, you know, or various other implementers really get crypto. I think that's been the second dirty secret uh, that's out there, is that a lot of thing goes wrong on the implementation path because the people doing the implementations don't actually understand, you know, they don't know some of the assumptions, they don't understand how to do it right. And then with developers, what we know is when it gets to a certain point, then they'll just go like, oh, well, you know, I won't do it. I just won't do it at all. You know, let's just send this stuff in the in the clear. And so this this basically, I mean, one of the the papers published uh, published last year um, is the uh, mental models of of HTTPS. And what you find there is, I mean, it's actually if you look at the the title of the paper, it one of the very very key misconceptions that is shared by these technic by these technical people as well as end users is that they actually they can't even they can't even dis uh, keep authentication and encryption apart yeah <laughs> they're actually you know um sort of like basically so so the title of the paper is if https was secure i wouldn't need to factor authentication right and once you think about it it really makes no, <laughs> from an expert's point of view this makes no sense whatsoever but if you look at, at their understanding, you know, that's basically, that's how fundamental these, these things goes wrong. And so um, you get, you know, basically you get them when you interview people about how does this actually work when you're implementing a certificate and so on, you get them to draw things. Uh, but as she says herself, you know, these, these drawings don't make any sense if you don't have the text of what they're actually, actually saying with it. And this is, this is very interesting. I mean, she holds this one effectively up as an example task action model. So this was basically an, an, an end user. She, she interviewed systems administrators and end users. And the end user actually co correctly explained how the certificate works in the sense like, you know, I connect and basically nobody can um, can actually read. You know, the, the basically people might try to snoop on the channel, but it won't help them um, because they can't read what I'm exchanging with the Amazon server. Right. And, and in fact, that model was a lot better than some of the ones that systems administrators produce. Um, and so but what's really interesting here is you can then start abstracting these models into once you know what they are, you know, how, what the misconceptions on the size of systems administrators are, you can then start to look at how to change the language and how to do things. So she basically has this, like, this is the worst case, you know, that's actually um, the... Um, you know, sort of like like the model that, that doesn't really work at all. And this is like the best case model. So if you're really lucky, you have somebody who understands, you know, who actually understands these elements of it and so on. And I think that's great. You know, that gives us a starting point for communicating more clearly to those particular um, groups of users and also to look at how we can support them better um, in, you know, through the documentation, through the security APIs, um, and also hopefully through what we should really teach, you know, an average computer science student should really be taught, uh, or a developer should really be taught in developer school, you know, which, which is very often absolutely nothing about cryptography. Uh, with, uh, and, and we just need to um, um, acknowledge that. So um, the conclusion would really be is there's been a lot of mental models uh, research. A lot of it has had to do with getting to people to use, um, uh, use some, some encrypted email tool or other, um, and then, you know, sort of like, like giving them some descriptions uh, of it. Um, 
but um, they, I would say, it's like I mean, we're actually finishing a, a big, a comp, you know, we're trying to do a complete literature review to take apart all the papers. But I'm pretty confident in saying that the problem with all of them is they're trying to get users, the end users, to acquire a structural model and they're sticking with the language, you know, with this, what I would call, you know, toxic language that will always trip users up because for them, you know, the everyday meaning, they can't just shake the everyday meaning of it and replace it. You know, they can't jump from one scenario to another. You know, that's what an expert can do, is knowing in this context, key means this thing. <laughs> in the other context, it means something something different. The properties of, uh, of a cryptographic key are very different from the properties of a physical key. Yeah, I mean, to you, it might go like, wow, pfft. You know, it's not, it's not that difficult, but for a person, for, for isn't. So we need to basically take the shift and move to functional models rather than trying to 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 put that down. The other key thing is is that we need to redo the linguistic building blocks. We need to find other words. You know, possibly a clean. Just start from constructing a language of its own that explains to 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 people the different elements and the different elements that they have to put together and how what are the different actions you can perform on those elements that would um, it would result in you know basically in certain content being turned into into an encrypted message and then being um, decrypted again um, consistent visual elements and workflow would also work. So here's here's actually another part of the problem. A lot of the we're going to come to to chat tools and so on and things. And a lot of these tools are developed as standalone tools by very dedicated people. You know, if you look at I think Signal is um, is the key example here. Um, and those people really don't know very much about usability at all. They also don't know very much about their target users. You know, they don't know about what language they use, what signs they would recognize, and so on. And again, they're producing something, and they go like, wow, it's fantastically secure. You know, you, you ought to use it, right? And they're not really trying at all to fit in with what people already recognize. What would they take as a sign of, <laughs> of something being, uh, being secure? Right, um, so they, they they're still basically basically not really accepting that um, that the world won't come to them and re and learn their world and their view of the world and and act in accordance with it. Is that if they want people to use it, they have to go out and fit in with uh, with what's ad uh, being used. So if we basically had consist consistent visual elements and a consistent workflow every time encryption is used across different, you know, whether it's a chat tool or an email tool or whatever, that would help, you know, users would then, that would really help to help them to build a, a functional model and also to recognize when something is wrong, you know, when, when something starts to deviate from the workflow they know. But at the moment, it's just a free for all and everybody just makes up these interactions and, and the visual elements, you know, as they, as they feel like it. And it's really like, you know, it's, it's a sort of like a bit of Mickey Mouse usability, if any, that's being applied there. It's not really doing it from, from scratch. Um, so I kind of like, I know how to do this properly. And, um, but I want to, want to give you an element, an example of, um, well, that didn't help us very much either. Um, in, um, in usability, when you're looking for a mental model, so a mental model is, is something that a person holds in their head, which helps them to predict how, what they, you know, to look at the device and ha helps them to work out what do I have to, what do I have to do so the device will carry out this task, this action that I want. Yeah, what do I, what do I have to do? Um, and when you, um, very often what designers look for is they're trying to cue a mental, an existing mental model in the user's head that's quite similar and then say like, ah, you know, but it's, um, you know, you, you just have to change, you just have to change it a little bit. You start developing it into a new mental model. Uh, and you can see this, like, you know, if you look at the graphical user interfaces, they were trying to imitate an office. You know, there's a rubbish bin and there are files and there's this kind of, you know, those kind of things. They don't, don't all behave exactly like the physical element does, but they're going like, oh, it's close enough. And through interaction, people then learn, you know, what's, what's different. And they develop a new understanding of what an electronic file is like and what an electronic rubbish bin is. 
Yes, they do, but quite a lot of them have, um, you know, have lost, <laughs> have lost in a certain number of files before uh, before they've actually really learned it, and uh, and then things start to like so. So now there's currently a big discussion out in the community. Why do so many people? Why do so many users store their files in the rubbish bin? No, which seems like seems an absurd thing to do. But it's again, when you look at it, you can understand how people actually arrive at, you know, that that basically they have trouble with the search functions, and so like you know, the, the rubbish bin is the one place where they feel like if they put it, I'll always be able to find it. Of course, they don't realize that a rubbish bin is also occasionally, you know, they're kind of like not. It's not emptied every day. You know, some, normally stuff I put there will still be there. Um, and but they don't realize there, there are circumstances under which the operating system will decide, you know, that the stuff can't stay. <laughs> and then they are very, very surprised. Yeah. So um, what, we, um, what we normally do is we basically, you look for candidate metaphors. And, and how we do this is we talk, we ask experts, but we also ask people who are not experts, but have used a particular tool for a while, how they would describe it. And we listen very carefully because they will often, when they try to explain it to somebody else, they will come up with a, you know, with a, a metaphor that you might be able to use. Um, and then what we do is we, we do an analytic evaluation of the metaphor using this, this four by four frame, which is we, we look at, here's the metaphor, here is the actual functionality that the user would need to understand to use the system correctly. How much does the metaphor explain directly? That's, that would be in this box. Um, then, um, then it would be, it suggests some features that the system doesn't actually support. That's not as great, but it's also, it's not a real downside because we can always think about whether we might be able to, to extend the system in future to cover some of those, you know, or if not, then we'd have to signal very clearly from the beginning, no, 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 it can't do those things. Um, this one is the one for extension where you basically, it's, it's uh, provided by the system, but not supported by the metaphor, where you then say, how can I change the metaphor to cover this additional, this ad additional functionality? So I can talk about like, you know, I have a, like a turbocharged system X, you know, or I combine it with another metaphor um, and say it's, you know, and it has those, those two things. So the real problem is this box at the bottom right is what's called conceptual baggage. And that's basically, um, uh, features implied, not implied by the, oh no, sorry, that's the conceptual, where's the conceptual direction, sorry, features provided by the system are not supported by the vehicle. Um, sorry, it's that one, that's the conceptual baggage, the, the, the minus. So the more you have of that, basically undoing something that's already in the metaphor is cognitively speaking about triple the workload as trying to add a new feature to an existing metaphor. So that's why, uh, right about this, yeah, that's basically why that one isn't so much of a problem, but that one is. Um, so, um, so that's what we're going to do is we listen to people and we pull out, you know, what they use as, as metaphors. And so here are some metaphors we found from a set of interviews on end-to-end -end encryption. Now, please don't laugh too, too loudly. But um, basically, so people said uh, it's a special language. Um, if um, when, I, when I exchange the, the, the messages with another person, it's translated into a special language, uh, which only the two of us, us have, have the dictionary for. Treasure hunt. Uh, messages and calls exchanged with the other person are like a treasure hidden in a place to which only the two of you know the map. Um, colors. Messages and calls to exchange with this person are like colors. Before sending them, you mix them with another color, which only the two of you know about. Um, and so when, you, when it gets to the other end, you basically know how to subtract, um, you know, to subtract that color from it. Um, banknote, messages and calls shared with this person are matched by a ripped, sorry, a ripped banknote, each piece being owned by two people. So I've got a formatting problem there. So it makes it harder to... Read. There we go. Uh, by the two people, therefore, uh, you can access the message pieces both need. And then, <laughs> the, probably the funniest one is the owl. 
um, messages and calls with this person will be delivered by your owl, which will not share the message with anyone but, but you two. So I think, okay, right. That's uh, what came out. So we thought, okay, let's try that. And let's compare it with um, two with the instructions that two of the encrypted chat tools give. You know, so um, you you may know you may remember that WhatsApp basically became you know fully end to end encrypted, and the slight tragedy of it was that most users don't know that. Right, it became encrypted. And it wasn't really clear. So what you still have at the moment is that, mo that people who use WhatsApp happily and enthusiastically will drop it and use SMS or Skype or email when they want to send something that's really sensitive. <laughs> yeah? Had you not heard this? This is actually very, a very common common thing that's going on. So in an attempt to combat this, WhatsApp then started to add a message saying, you know, um, the, your conversations are end-to-end -end encrypted. <laughs> um, and that's really secure, is effectively what it says. And Telegram um, and Viber simply have another instructions that say, you know, it's, it's kind of, it is all, all very, um, you know, <laughs> all very secure. So we then put, uh, we basically put out a survey where we, um, where we basically asked people who used encrypted messaging tools to rate these four statements as true or false. And <coughs> then we did is we, we basically put them through, um, so basically it's like statement one, only you and you, the recipient can read your messages, which is true. Uh, statement two, other people can send a message pretending to be you, which is false. Um, only statement three is only you and the recipient can know the messages were sent, which is false. And if uh, statement four, if somebody hacks your phone, they will be able to read your messages, which is true. All right. So we asked them to basically rate those statements as true or false. And then we gave them either a metaphor or one of those statements provided by WhatsApp or Telegram uh, Viber. Uh, because we said, like, OK, so um, in, in the original round, um, most people made about, got about half the statements right and half the statements wrong. So we thought, like, if we now try, you know, can we see which intervention will lead to people um, performing better and actually having a better understanding because they can rate these statements correctly as true or false. Uh, and the answer was, um, you know, um, it, didn't, it didn't really help at all. So, in fact, um, the one metaphor that had the least changes from correct to incorrect was the um, colors one. So basically, more people ended up with more correct statements than incorrect statements uh, when they got, because they got the colors message. But for all the other things, um, it, it was essentially like it was a bit of a car crash, right? None of this really helped to help people to correctly assess what protection they were, they were being offered. So as I said, uh, sort of round one didn't really work. <laughs> But um, this is continuing, this is continuing work now. So we're assessing, you know, a wider range of different metaphors with different user groups. And hopefully we will, um, you know, we will see if this helps at all. And the answer is, if it doesn't really help at all, then the only alternative is, um, is clean, is to create a new language from scratch. And effectively, you have to push people to just learn that new language and the associated actions. It may be the only way forward. I just wanted to, to, to finish, but also still saying, like, I think the way about, you know, there's still this problem about how we go about designing um, these, um, these things. So, uh, and it's, it's a research approach that, that, again, I think actually isn't very often tried um, in, in usability research. You would normally be quite interested if people stopped using a particular tool, you know, if they were interested enough to adopt it, but then stopped using it. You would go and um, you know find out why you know what was it that was that was wrong with it, and that's what what Ruba Osama did, and actually published this in the uh, in the I triple um, you know sort of I, I triple E um, 
this actually it's not under review anymore. It's, it, it was accepted. It was published last year in um, IEEE Free Security and Privacy Symposium. Um, so where she interviewed 60 people who had adopted the tool and 50 of them had stopped using, uh, had using um, the, these different ones. Um, and what we basically found there was that the strongest argument was not usability. It's yes, these tools still have usability problems, but it's actually the lack of utility. So what people were saying is like, I'm taking up, you know, if I'm using a chat tool, I'm using it to communicate with people. And if the people I don't want to communicate it, Kate with don't use it, <laughs> that's not very good. You know, and that's what they, they actually found. Uh, so um, if the tool, I think that's basically, it hints to a really essential problem. If you're trying to create an encrypted tool, but it's not professionally designed and it doesn't offer the functionality people are looking for. It doesn't offer the utility that people are looking for. The fact that it's secure ain't going to sell it, to put it very bluntly. Yeah. So if it's not very good at the primary function, um, then security won't be, you know, it might, that might be a selling point for some very high risk individuals who actually really believe they are at risk and, and want to protect themselves. But for the, for, for uh, most people, it won't because it's essentially like, you know, if this was a, were a car, um, it wouldn't, it's basically, it doesn't, it goes, it runs, it runs very well, but it doesn't go to most of the places you want to go, you know, <laughs> which is, uh, which is not, uh, not not very uh, you know very good and even um, you know basically um, you know so even though th this has been the problem with signal as well is that people give up on it even though it's very clearly rated to be the most secure tool but people aren't picking you know aren't picking it up I mean usability really if you if you look at it the problems are still you know there's still a lot of problems usability problems around but that's kind of like the cargoes where you want to go to but you occasionally have to push it you know, because it, uh, it won't do it of its own accord. I mean, the whole thing um, is, is it's still, we just uh, run a survey where we looked at in a follow-up paper to, to, to Telegram, you know, study of Telegram users. We did a couple of years ago. And when you basically say to people, you know, ask people, why did you decide to use Telegram? If you just look at the totals at the end, you know, the fact that it was secure was mentioned by by 19 people, but um, it's you know somebody else was using it um, is is a very key factor. You know, it's, it's the highest number in adopting it. Um, and when you ask people why did you decide to stop using it, um, you know, I didn't really have a use for it. Uh, 18, and then at the bottom, my contacts had stopped using it. 29. Why? Right, that's the overwhelming majority of reason. So um, it's, you know, if people aren't getting out, you know, if, 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 if a certain percentage of users decide it's not worth it, then the utility really starts to go downhill. And I think you'll never um, sort of like get people to adapt it. You know, I think it's, it's, it's really sort of like very clear, you know, they don't understand, you know, people don't understand the difference between point to point and end to end encryption, forward secrecy or fingerprint verification. Um, they also don't think, and this hints at a wider problem, they also don't understand there's some really fundamental misunderstandings that influence their trust models. And this is something we, we have to really figure out how, you know, there's a much broader communication that needs to be done. What they um, think, I mean, they still think there is security, you know, by, you know, sort of these are the typical misconceptions. You know, I'm not rich, I'm not famous. Um, using a different tool means using different channels. Um, but at the same time, they say, you know, mess iMessage, Google Hangouts and SMS are all the same. Um, and they trust tools that are well designed, that are stable, don't crash, that deliver good quality. You know, that basically is a trust halo that then also makes them assume they are secure. This is, of course, it's not correct. It's wrong. Um, but there's also the other key misconceptions that really stop adoption are um, it's not worth using secure tools. So basically, people don't in believe encryption works. The typical statement you'll find from, from over 80% of participants in the studies is that the service provider or the government or anyone who was involved in writing the tool can actually break it and believe it, right? 
the second one is that they think the, the kind of what we typically see as quality marks for an encrypted tool um, are interpreted the other way around, that they think that um, a secret, you know, if the algorithm is a secret and it's proprietary, that that makes it more secure than if it's public. And so these are really two funda mis fundamental misconceptions that need to be addressed, as well as working on any individual tool you're trying to promote. Yeah? If we don't actually get that perception adjusted, it just won't, uh, it just won't work. Uh, it's another, another really key, um, it, another example here was, um, I don't know if you've heard of this scheme, this is an online identity scheme in the UK. And basically, they're very proudly, it uses zero, a zero knowledge authentication, I should say, not zero knowledge proof underneath. Uh, and it's so basically, it says, you know, please, um, I'm, I'm transferring this information. Are you okay with it? And it that said on the right hand side, very proudly, did you know, in order to protect your privacy, we do not know who the transaction provider is? Right? That's a problem because whether I trust, you know, so the, the whole to, to people, the whole idea that you would give the data to somebody and you don't know who they are is just completely absurd, right? In their world, knowing who you're dealing with is a very, very key element of trust, you know. And so basically, this is the kind of thing, you know, um, you know, then, then they're saying in response, you know, that's... Um, you know, I, I, I just wouldn't do it. And so if you, you know, you need to really be aware of what people see as a, as a sign of trust. So, um, and, and, you know, if you're not, if you're not basically providing the identity, in this case, you know, talking about zero knowledge authentication underneath is really not a selling point. You know, it'll turn, uh, it'll turn people off. You know, so what I would say is the usability yeah, there is still a lot to do. You know, we have a whole, whole sort of like cabinet of uh, of horrors. I mean, I think if you've if you've ever used Telegram or looked at it, you know, the fact that that the vast majority of people never encrypt any message they send in Telegram, but think because they're using Telegram it is secure, right? They're blissfully unaware that the group chat is not encrypted, um, and that you actually have to go to encrypted mode in order to even use it in point to point is um, you know is is really one of the the key things, but I think, um, you know, and with something like WhatsApp, I think it's been a really good lesson to learn that you can't just provide the functionality and assume the fact that people, it doesn't look any different, it's good. You know, you need, if you, de if you don't basically say, you know, it's, it's great, it, we've got a fantastic user base, you know, we, you can try to reply, oh, by the way, it's also really, really secure. If you don't get that message across, then basically people jump off and do their, their risky transaction in a different tool, which really is, is completely counterproductive. I think we can actually crack this if we understand the broader requirements of, of what people actually want and how to look at it. I th um, the utility problem, I think, is not that easily solved. You know, I think what it really means is you can't have people sitting in very small groups, you know, creating a, a tool without really having usability experts, you know, and, and the backup of, a, of an organization that can really, it really around. I think at the very least, it would take something, you know, of the size of the Mozilla Foundation to start, to start actually getting, in, you know, where you've got a user, a significant user base with, with Mozilla. It would need something like that, that through which you need to go in order to get your encrypted solutions uh, out there. You know, um, and I think that's, that's really going to be, be one of the things, you know. Um, mass distribution of keys and tools is still an issue. You know, Germany is like, you know, bless their cotton socks, you know, with their crypto parties and their Volksverschlüsselung and people driving around in little Volkswagen buses to shopping centers, you know, encouraging people to get, to get a key, you know, and get a certificate. But it's not scaling. You know, what we need is it's a parallel to this. You need the big telecom providers to basically say, we're going to give them to all of our customers. You know, we know our customers, we've verified them already. You know, we can give them um, a key certificate. And then we build into our communication how you use that as part of the email tools um, you already use or the chat tools you already use. I think that's where we need to go in future. So thanks very much. Thank you.